What's up guys? We're on fire year coach number six. We're just tearing through these things. If you haven't caught up, remember there's a playlist with all of these in order. We started at the basics and we're going to move all the way up to more advanced methods of programming. Today we are talking about volume. We've been talking about progressions. We've been going over the first steps you take when you're first learning how to progress your workouts forward. And so far we've talked about weight. Adding weight is a very valuable, necessary method of progression, but it's a smaller piece of a bigger picture. Volume, we're going to talk about the amount of work and how you can use that as another adaptive stress. And we're going to start to talk around kind of how that fits into a bigger picture when we do eventually talk about things like periodization or more advanced macro cycles. For right now, remember the Bromley t-shirt, Strength Conquers, Brick by Brick, and and Big Dreams Bad Jeans are available at the Barbell Apparel Store, so check those out. Link is below. So getting into volume. Now, what we mean by volume, because this is where it gets a little, uh, a little messy because there's different connotations of what we're talking about. Generally, we're referring about the amount of work. Increasing volume means more work. Now, you can get very specific, and it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about because volume can refer to like the number of sets. So if you're doing you know, bicep curls with a 45 pound barbell and you go from doing two or three sets in a workout to doing five or six, that's a big increase in volume. But it can change a little bit if you're talking about changes in sets as opposed to changes in sets along with percentage and total number of reps and effort and all the other things. Because as one changes a lot, it's going to change some of the other dials. So it's not necessarily going to represent the same type of stress is going to affect directionality a little bit. So you can talk about the number of lifts. That's something people will keep track of. Did I do 37 touches of squats or did I do four? And that's going to have different, uh, different things associated with it. And you can also talk about tonnage, which is like if every pound lifted was a brick, how many bricks did you lift? Did you do a thousand pounds of total tonnage, just sets times reps times weight? And it doesn't matter that we have a specific definition because generally we're just concerned about more work. So we're not really talking about volume over what happens over an entire macro cycle like uh, this, like if you're moving through blocks. For today, we're talking about how to use it as a method of progression within a block. Again, still talking about week to week, session to session. So we're going to assume that weight is about the same. It's not moving a ton. We're not going from like 70% and making huge volume changes up to like 95% and referring to it like there's an exchange rate there because it gets lost a little bit. Effort's gonna be about the same. Rep ranges are gonna be about the same. So what would happen again this week to next week into maybe like the next several weeks? That's the scope of what we're talking about today. So this is all small scale. Now, zooming out, looking at the big scale, it's normally talked about that volume and intensity are inversely related. So as weight goes up over time, volume has to drop. Now, this is something that people repeat like it's a staple of their uh, of their ideology, like it's something that's a, a fixed point in the stars that you can't move, and that's not necessarily true. This inverse relationship is very important when you're talking about the end of a contest prep, when you've done a bunch of work to prepare and fatigue is very high and you got to pull it away as weight climbs and you get more specific because you need that recovery to handle the increase in poundages and you need the recovery to allow super compensation. So you peak right. That's when it's really important. So generally linear periodization, like classical periodization, which not a lot of people do in that kind of pure simplified sense is like 30 or 40 years ago, even though we still talk about it a lot, it's generally starting very light percentages with just a ton of work. And then every increase in weight is met with a reduction in volume. So it's this nice linear straight line all the way up into the point where you hit your contest peak. And that's where you're very specific. Weights are very high. Nervous system is on point. You're comfortable under those heavy ass weights, but you're so recovered from all of this work that that fatigue dissipates. You get strong. It's a great model. This is where it really matters. The last, let's say six weeks, maybe like 10 weeks. But even then, I mean, if you've grown a lot generally and you got six weeks to prepare, you can go through a nice taper without really having to follow this model. In fact, a lot of off season stuff, or if, if you're not close to a contest, if you're just focused on growing, can absolutely look like this, where you're focused on like maybe increasing volume, but you're not actually getting heavier, uh, really to that great of a degree, using other things to drive progress forward, where it might bounce back and forth before a oh, way to contest came up. Now I got to be contest ready. I go through that peak. So this gets challenged quite a bit and you see it with things like conjugate. You see it. I mean, if anybody's tracked exactly what they do off season, it's never this nice uh, tapered execution. It's always like finding ways to improve where you can. And sometimes that means 
focusing on the same kind of weight for a long time, doing some type of step loading thing, maybe doing wave stuff, maybe you'll go, you'll go through periods where you do a lot of volume, maybe you'll drop down and do something more high intensity. And there's a lot of ebb and flow that you can incorporate that's not necessarily gonna be this nice clean taper. So keeping that in mind, let's get into what we would actually do a week to week, set to set. Are you looking for access to exclusive programs from the best minds in the field and some of your favorite YouTube influencers? Then look no further than Boost Camp. Boost Camp is a long-term sponsor of this channel and I wouldn't be partnered with them if they didn't provide a premier product. If you want optimal performance, you can't just wing your weight selection. You have to make deliberate steps forward. So you need a program and you need a way to track progress on it. Boost Camp makes it easy to track your workouts from the convenience of your phone so you never have to rely on your sloppy handwriting or your bad memory. And they give you access to a library of exclusive programs from some of the most well-known names in the business. Eric Helms, Bryce Lewis, Jeffrey Verity Schofield, Bald Omni-Man, and yours truly. We all have programs up there that can only be found on the app and it is absolutely free. My programs, Bull Mastiff and 70s Powerlifter are both up there. And you can also check out Full Sturker, which I wrote to tell you how to get strongman jacked using just the things you find in a regular corporate gym. So a special thank you to Boost Camp for making this channel possible. Unburden yourself from the hard business of making the perfect program from scratch. We've got them pre-made for you. Download their app right now by clicking on the link in the description. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different uh, applications. If we're talking about just like bodybuilding accessory stuff, which a lot of you people watching this probably are interested in. Uh, I'm gonna give you some methods for that, or if you're doing like a barbell movement, it's just kind of a broad developmental movement. Once we get into strength specific territory, where the squat, the deadlift, the bench, even the overhead is something that has to follow a schedule, there's predictability that has to be associated with it, that's a different can of worms. So think of like strain, with things where you can just accrue a bunch of fatigue and that's the main thing that's going to drive you forward versus skill where you're getting touches, you're getting practice and you need to kind of find a way to keep that moving forward without getting into the weeds where it affects you the next time around. Because if you blow your wad, you're not going to leave room to increase for the next week or the next block and it's going to set you back and it's a mess. So that's why strength athletes have, they have a harder go about it. You have to be a little more present, a little more deliberate in your movements. So that's what this is gonna represent, but let's start with the smaller stuff. Volumizing is something I put in my books, base strength, peak strength, if you haven't checked those out, Amazon store on my website, again, link in the description. Um, all of it, there's so many examples I have and there's more that I can give. I keep kicking around the idea of doing a big book of progressions, but I don't know if that'll do anything other than just give you paralysis by analysis. Volumizing is one of my favorite things because that's something I myself had a lot of success with and a lot of my clients. Like this is something I've tried with a lot of people and it worked very well in certain situations, it worked very aggressively well. Um, the idea being that if you are in this like linearly periodized thing, why would you start with like five sets of 12, five sets of 10, the most amount of volume with the highest reps that you could possibly do doesn't it make sense if you're getting strength specific down the road when you, you're doing those triples, doubles, singles, or when you're doing fives or sixes kind of in preparation of those, that you would do more work there if that's the actual sport that you're, that's a, the thing you need for the sport you're getting ready for. That's the most specific, you need the most touches. And there's some examples that actually take that into consideration. So if you're not used to volume and you go and you do five sets of 10, you're just screwed, you're fucked. It's hard doing anything. You're like, oh my God, how am I gonna be able to get through life, let alone work? So it doesn't make sense to start with that big hit when you're out of shape and do all those sets in that threshold where weights aren't gonna be that high. You're gonna have to keep the weight down quite a bit. If you do five sets of 10 with, with a weight for deadlifts, it's like, what are you doing? You could have gone, 10 or 15% heavier and done two or three really good sets of 10. And that would have been a different story. So instead, I like to start a little bit, just a little dabble do you, especially if you're not used to it. If you're coming off a taper or a peak where you're doing like singles, doubles, and triples, one set of 10, that's enough. So I got in the habit of doing a couple sets and then doing a little more and a little more and a little more as I got used to it. And as I got conditioned, I was able to just handle so much work with pretty heavy weights. So it was like the best of both worlds. So I get this huge growth uh, growth surge. And then I could use that for the rest of my contest specific block. And then there's times where it would make sense where I'd be doing like four or five triples, you know, a lot more sets with more strength specific work way down the road. So volumizing is a method where I do that. Generally, let's, let's take a four week block as an example. Two by 12 is something I might start with. And I don't even have to have the effort that high. If you're not used to it, that'll light you up. And for all intents and purposes, whether you're doing a squat or whether you're doing it for an accessory like rear delt flies or something, let's say you do 60 pounds, 
two sets of failure or an AMRAP. And if it's your first week, you can even hedge that a little bit. Let's say you do a set of 12 and a set of 10. The idea is the next week you would come in and now you're doing a third set, weight about the same, and maybe you see some improvement. Maybe you go 12, 12, nine, and you're like, holy crap, okay, a little bit better with another set, that's fantastic. Week four, week four sucks, because you're not just doing it for this, you're doing it for a lot of exercises. So you might not even necessarily see improvement as fatigue starts to build up, but it doesn't matter because you're still putting out effort, you're still showing more work. Objectively, the amount of work you're doing with that weight has gone up. So even if your numbers aren't quite right, it, it doesn't matter, so what? You still got the stress and then you can go into a deload. So going where you're doing 12s here, maybe drop the weight for a couple sets of 10s, kind of easy, clear out, come back the next week. So it follows this wave pattern like we've covered already with weight, but instead we're doing it with volume, with the number of sets we're doing. Number of sets also is like the easiest way to turn the dial of volume because one set brings with it so much more total tonnage. Whereas if you add one rep here or there, the effort might be a little bit higher, but the numerically it's not quite as big of a stress. So, and I also like to keep these close. Don't try to work up from like two sets to like nine sets in a short period of time. You're just trying to clip off one extra set. That's a big stress. And you can repeat that. I've had a lot of luck with that. A lot of, uh, a lot of really good results. You can extend it. You could go four or five weeks in a row, taking a couple weeks at each step, couple weeks of two sets, couple weeks of three sets, couple weeks of four sets, and you can move that forward accordingly. That works very well. And you can also play around with this, especially with the accessory stuff, it doesn't matter so much. And the cool thing when you're in like an off-season developmental phase, even with the compound movements, if you're working in these rep ranges, the cool thing is you don't have to walk a tightrope. So even with something like a bench or a squat, you might be able to play around with this. So let's say instead of 60 pounds uh, all three weeks, instead maybe you do a range. You're like, okay, well, I'm gonna bank on adding weight and I'm gonna give some play in the joints. Maybe I'll go 60 pounds this week to get my toe in the water. Next week, maybe I'll go 60 or 65. Maybe I'll change it set to set, depending on how I feel. Maybe I'll move in a little pyramid where week three I'll go 60, 65, 70, maybe back down to 60 on the last week. It doesn't matter because numerically the stress is still so much bigger and it gives you the opportunity to play and uh, experience the stress a little bit of a different way. Another way to do it instead of going up each week is to keep the volume static over a longer block, demonstrate mastery with that set and rep count with that weight and then go up in the next block. So with this example, four weeks at two sets of 10 to 12. And you probably wanna give yourself a range on this one because since you're not using volume each week to drive progress, you need to be able to work within the prescribed sets and reps. So having a range of reps allows you to chase that using something like a double progression where you would do, let's say find something week one, two sets of 10, and then you stay around with that until you can get to 12 and then you can add weight and repeat, and that works very well. And then the next block, you would go up to three sets. Now you're around the same weight. Again, similar weight, similar effort, similar set and rep scheme, but now we're adding another set. That represents 50% more work, all things being uh, equal. And then block after that, you go into four. And you can wave back and forth. You can go by feel. You can run four sets up to five sets. You can dial back. You can take a couple weeks to clear out. Try back again, see how your strength persists. You can play around with moving the, the weight up and down. You don't have to do all the sets. In fact, it's probably not even ideal to do all the sets at the exact same weight. So you can recover a little bit more. I always like to go a little heavier to a little lighter. Something like reverse pyramid works out very well. And this sets you up very nicely. And you can spend multiple blocks in the three, four rep range. After enough time, you can move to something more high intensity based. All the people that say how hit is wonderful because they did volume for so many years and then they, dropped the volume and recover. They're like, oh my God, I got so big and strong. It's not because hit is so magical. It's because they did it on the back end of all of this volume. They spent so much time building a resilience at that, uh, with this protocol, with this type of range that it stopped becoming a good stress repeated, uh, sorry, the repeat about effect diminished return set in and you end up just not getting as good of a result. So letting yourself clear out and recover, all of a sudden that surge of recovery just takes you to the moon. But again, it's temporary. Over time, that will offer diminished returns as well. So that's why we have uh, ebb back and forth. And it's why anybody that tries to sell something as being the best, it just it makes me wanna put a gun in my mouth because that means you don't understand what programming is or why it's necessary. It means you haven't been around long enough to actually face a plateau and figure out how to get over it because nothing stays static in programming. Programming is 
the recognition that the same thing does not work forever, which is why we need variety. We just have to control it. Now this, this guy is what you're gonna use for more of a strength specific approach. This is what you would use for your main lifts and a more specific powerlifting block. Uh, I've had a lot of success with this as well, especially clients I could work with in person, one-on-one. -on -one. It's very hard for me to do this remotely, but in person, one-on-one, -on -one, I can see how they're maneuvering and I can organically maneuver them around in a workout, depending on how they feel, because this gives you so much room to play around with. So imagine like a Shaco template, I've talked about it ad nauseum. It's one of the most accessible, uh, types of skill-specific powerlifting training, which means high frequency, squat, bench, deadlift, two to three times per week, uh, not a lot of accessory, so it's all about skill work. That's what you wanna think about. The touches aren't strain. It's not like doing sets to failure. It's not the heaviest way you can handle. Everything is doable so that technique can be pristine. You're manipulating volume in order to keep things going. You're not working up to the heaviest weight you can handle. It almost never gets to that point. So what you notice is that you actually don't need those really hard reps in order to grow. Volume does a great job, even with skill work. Same thing with Olympic lifting, which is where it's derived from. Take an Olympic lifter. They're not great movements for size. Have them double up the amount of clean and jerks they do at any given percentage, they grow. That's why they call them hypertrophy phases, volume phases. You just do more practice, you still grow. So what we're doing is we're assigning it every percentage along the way. A number of reps, it's good, but it's doable. Even if you're tired, it's doable. So we know that nothing here really puts you up against failure. So fives, maybe up to 70%, 75 by four, 80 by three, 85 by two, singles all the way up, none of those. You're all gonna look at that like, what, that's nothing, what am I doing here? But when you do the entire work, anybody who's ran a Shaco program knows it's hard because you're looking all the warm up sets all the way up, all the back off sets on the way down, 10, 12 sets, you're gassed, you do it a couple times per week, it adds up. So the way I like to run this, which I've had a ton of success with, first of all, easiest way to break it up into, into cycles, draw this pyramid and draw a line. 75% and then 85%, this would be block one, this would be block two, all the way up to 100% would be like your contest prep block, and it can be four, five, six weeks. This is super easy to take you all the way to a contest prep. Block one, you're not going above 75%, and you're not going above 75% by four. This is gonna take away a lot of decision-making from you, which is gonna make things easy. So you're going to move the whole way up, 60, 65, 70, 75. So by the time you get to 75 uh, percent for four reps, you've already done four sets. And you might think they're warm-up sets. Who cares? I'm telling you, they contribute. Then what you're going to do is work your way right back down. So what we've got, that's a crappy pyramid, but you get the idea. So that's our first workout. Pretty easy. In fact, if you're deconditioned, it might actually feel kind of substantial. Well, what are you going to do the next week? Again, focusing on adding volume. None of the hard work is going to increase. The intensity isn't going to increase. You're going to do the exact same thing, but now you might throw in a couple of extra sets on the way down. So I warmed up, did another set at 75. Maybe I did another set on the way down at 70 and then back down. Boom, we got a couple extra sets and another set at the highest weight. This again, doesn't seem like much. I'm telling you, it contributes. And if I'm uh, working with somebody who's not on a deadline and I can take liberties with, with them, I did this with my client, Joe, who was older. He was in his fifties, I believe, uh, and got very strong considering he was an older gentleman. He wasn't on any testosterone or anything. And I was able to just kind of decide what he should go with based on how he was doing because if something's super lazy, okay, we could take our liberties a little bit. Occasionally I'd have him bleed up. I'd be like, well, let's put another 10 pounds on. Let's get you another set at where you topped out last week. There's a lot of back and forth you can do and it works out. So again, the week after that, we're gonna run through the same thing. And you know what, let's say that's so good, I'm gonna break the rules. I'm gonna have you, oh man, that it just looked good. It was moving too quick. So I have you go a little bit above that 75% just to get a touch. And now we're gonna go to 75 again and now we're gonna go back down. And notice how every time we do this, the area under this curve gets bigger. That's more volume, that's more work. The area under the curve is a volume. As we take up more and more time until the fourth or fifth week, I mean, you're just encompassing like this whole thing and it adds up to a lot of work. You have a lot of options, it's intuitive, and it's just super easy to think about climbing up, meandering, climbing back down. That's it, we're just finding these different paths up the mountain. 
once you get into this next block, it's the exact same thing. Just now you're exposing yourself to more weight and we're finding ways to fill this out. You know, we're gonna have the first week where we come in and we just do another little pyramid. The next week we're gonna hang around a little bit longer and then we might even spend a couple more sets on the way up and on the way down in order to just, again, fill out the area under that curve and it just works super well. And with this guy, you're not gonna hit 100% until the last day, but the third block, it's like up to 90 for a few, up to 95 on week two, spend some time getting comfortable with that, recover, hit that 100%, and it's gonna fly. And next thing you know, when you go to max out, it's just, it moves super easily. This is a skill-based approach. This is the foundation of what you're seeing when you see somebody squat bench deadlift multiple times in the same week, when you're like, how do they do that? If I do a hard set, on Monday, I'm not able to do a hard set again on Thursday. And that's the answer. It's not the hard set. It's the waving back and forth of volume and intensity. And it's having a mastery of that week to week, set to set, block to block that allows you to keep going long term. And this is how you balance more stress with more recovery. This is going to be a little harder to manage if you are going RP10 on everything. You can manage it pretty well as long as you have these kind of fixed stops where the work is set for you. You know you're not gonna blow your wad. You don't need to be 105% every single day to hit your prescribed work. You don't need to cross your fingers and hope you got strong because that's not really the point of this. So these are my favorite ways to add volume. Again, super easy to do these with um, higher rep approaches to the compound movements or if you're just trying to develop some size, you're not trying to find a strict schedule. Accessories, smaller movements, isolation stuff works great. And this is my go-to if I'm trying to take a more specific approach, we're really focused on the main movements. So that's all I got for today, guys. In the future, we're gonna take this, put it in the context of a much bigger template so you can see how things look in the form of like a periodized contest approach. That's not necessarily how you have to be training, but if you're a strength athlete and you're looking for a way to meander your lifts forward without having to go like just bloodthirsty, you know, cover your face in war paint and just go for the jugular. Sometimes it's nice to have a plan where you can work on the skill and you can let the program do its thing while you adapt. So one of my favorites. So leave your questions and comments in the comment section. Better yet, take it to Patreon. That is where I update my training weekly. That's where I respond to messages. If you want to get in touch with me, easiest way to do it. Thank you so much, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.